Great relationships don't just happen. If you want one, you've got to make it yourself. But how do you do that when you didn't have the models and examples that you needed? Some of us were lucky enough to have seen one or two solid marriages growing up. But that's not really enough since what worked for them isn't necessarily going to work for you. And lots of us just started doing marriage and love and relationships the way we thought was expected. Only to find ourselves in a love story that's, I don't know, okay, I guess? There's no right one right way to do love. That's good news. You can let go of all that old baggage and craft a marriage or partnership or chosen family or polycule or whatever that is so much more than okay. It's really the creation of a life that finally feels like home. At least that's what doing this has felt like for me. Me too. And getting here wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for us. We learned the hard way, the very hard way, that love is a verb. And the actions of love don't just come naturally. We all need skills and tools and support to do this well. And that's completely normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, research psychologist and ASEC certified sexuality educator. I'll be sharing personal stories, evidence-based research, and case studies from my work as a relationship coach. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Um, I'm a human doing my best to make relationships my biggest priority in life. We're going to dig deep and offer vulnerable conversations between us as we keep learning how to customize our love and keep growing as individuals. As individuals. As individuals. And as a couple. And as a moresome. It's all very interesting. And we're also going to have some amazing, nuanced conversations with experts who can help you learn more ways to design the life you want. And if you find yourself saying at any point, damn, I really needed to hear that while you're listening, I would love it, we would love it, if you would head over and give us a quick rate and review on iTunes. It really does help other people find us, and we'd be so grateful for that. Now, it's time to reimagine your relationship from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Hi, Ken. Hello, Jolie. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about expansive intimacy, which we've done before a lot, right? We talk about expanding intimacy. We talk about doing that by visiting sex toy shops, and we talk about it by having threesomes, and we talk about it about um, open like relationships in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. But this week... I, I think this is like a getting back to basics in some ways. Yeah. But it is also profoundly important part of, of how we talk about intimacy. I'm going to talk about expansive intimacy with a guy who knows something about it. We're going to talk. We've talked with Jim Young. Yeah. So Jim Young um, has recently written a book about expansive intimacy. And... I can't wait for everybody to get a hold of this book, but I actually just can't wait for you to get a hold of this book. Yes, right? <laughs> because yeah. you and I talk about expanding intimacy, but we're often in that like sexual, sensual realm. Right. Jim is coming at this work from a completely different perspective. Yeah. Because Jim's Comes a burnout out, out coach, so yep. he's he's talking about expansive intimacy. Yeah, really in that in that friendship and yeah, like what we think platonic, of as social, platonic. intimacy mm -hmm. realm. Yeah. Mm. That's good stuff. And I it's, know that you have struggled with this. I do. I struggle with things in that realm um, quite a bit. And I am looking forward to getting that book out there yeah. among the people who, like me, struggle in that area. And there are a lot of um, male socialized people in particular because part of that socialization is this isolation and independence yeah. which is in opposition to the intimacy and linked to burnout. And so the conversation with Jim was wonderful. Right. So we, we're we going to keep this really tight right now because the conversation is juicy and it's power packed. And I would say that if if you have a person in your life, someone who you love, who was raised and socialized to be a man, I think this is the episode to pass to them. Yes. Because what we're talking about can open doors of vulnerability and availability um, way out past what is typically offered to us, but absolutely fits within a monogamous container. Mm -hmm. So you and I are all about the, 
<laughs> yeah, relationship that's... style agnosticism. Yeah. It's it's not about that. It's about deepening intimacy in whatever ways feel right to you. And so I think this conversation is in particular a great invitation for all of us, and especially for those of you who were socialized to imagine that you weren't supposed to have feelings <laughs> or that yep. your feelings were less important than other people's or certainly should be subservient to your thinkings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All these things are, um, they're, they, they can be addressed. They can be they addressed. Can be responded to from wherever you are right now. Right. So uh, yeah, without further ado, I think we should get into this conversation. Yeah. Jim Young is a, a men's burnout coach, as we mentioned, who discovered a unique antidote to the vexing dilemma of burnout, which I think we're all familiar with to some extent, something he calls expansive intimacy. Jim's coaching work focuses on helping men discard old stereotypes and, and then take the risks to provide them access to the, the intimate relationships that they crave across all areas of their lives. Okay, this is a good one. Buckle in. And then pass this episode along, Do pass too. pass it along. This pass is going to be around. one that needs to be. And get yourself a copy of Jim's book. It will be back out in fall of 2022. Right. So get yourself a copy. I already pre-read it. It's great. It's You're going to want it on your shelf. So let's have this conversation. So hi, Jim. It is so great to have you. I feel like I've been gearing up for this conversation for like a year. So looking forward to this. Right. Because you've been writing a book. I have been. And above and beyond that, it's just so fun whenever I get a chance to talk to either one of you so that I get to talk to both of you at the same time is just, it's blissful. Right. At the same time and through the magic of Zoom, we get to have this conversation and actually I don't have to look at him right now, but I can still see him. This is very exciting for me. I, I'm I'm really <laughs> basking in the miracle of technology right now. And if it weren't for my giant microphone taking up the whole space, I'd be 100% satisfied by the experience. <laughs> I'm enjoying talking to all three of you already. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> me, you and the microphone. So I think we should start right off, Jim, by mm. talking about and establishing why you wrote your book. Tell us the title. Sure. And tell us why this book for you. The title of the book is Expansive Intimacy, How Tough Guys Defeat Burnout. And it's a book that is largely, as I think many books are, my story. Uh, so certainly this has a ton of personal resonance, but it also connects to a lot of the pain that I've been witnessing in the world as a, a coach working with men, just being in society, reflecting on my own past experiences in the corporate world. Uh, I went through a really long bout of burnout. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know what to call it that. It took me years later to actually use those words for it or that word for it. And then it took me a while to recognize, oh, I'm not burned out anymore. And how the hell did that happen? And as I rewound that reel and looked at what were the steps along the way, I realized what I had done was create a bunch of intimate relationships across my life. And that by doing so, I made my life burnout proof. I still have all the stresses. I still have the worries and the fears. And they pass through so much faster. They don't build up because I have places to put them. <sighs> wow. Okay. So... I think this is unique because other than Emily and Amelia Nagoski, I don't mm -hmm. believe who wrote the wonderful book Burnout, which is largely focused on a, a slightly more feminine experience of burnout. And you are yeah. focused a little bit more on a masculine experience, though. I think that the idea of that is, well, maybe one of the things we can talk about why yeah, it yes, matters yes. at all. Yep. But um, I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about burnout related specifically to intimacy before hearing this from you. And I think even when I was hearing it from Emily and Amelia, I was hearing it as a part of a larger whole. And you seem to have really focused on intimacy as really the, the solution to burnout. And so describe to us what is expansive intimacy exactly? Yeah, I've, I've landed on it as the opposite of burnout. And just as a context piece, a lot of the 
work that I do is in corporate settings, and there's a, a famous burnout assessment called the Maslach Burnout Inventory that I use with clients, and they define the opposite of burnout is engagement. And I frankly think that's dangerous and bullshit because engagement encourages us to like get fully into our work and be so into it. Um, and not to diminish the researcher's work, it's fabulous, but I, I, I quibble with that term. So in, in for me, we need something that's a non-work alternative to burnout because so much of burnout comes from work, not all of it, but most of it. Um, and expansive intimacy to me is that is this notion that I can have intimate connection in so many realms of life, and you, uh, intimacy gets euphemized all the time. It's it's oh, about tell a me sexual, about it. yeah, right. right? Like, <laughs> You've heard this. <laughs> I I think that you using this word is one of the best doses of medicine our culture could get because I am so sick of people thinking that my work is all about sex. I love talking about sex, but really yeah. I'm talking about intimacy and connection. Yeah. And, and intimacy you- is about sex, right? It's like one of the most fabulous versions of intimacy right. and it's a slice. And, you know, Ken and I had uh, an intimate experience in a men's group that we, we were part of for several months or a year uh, back in 2020. And like to be able to get on a call with a bunch of other men and talk about like what comes up in us when we're dealing with things like white privilege, right. um, mm-hmm. like that is an intimate moment that I get to see that Ken has similar feelings that I do and similar worries and he's confused in the same ways that I am and has these hopes. And like, now I know this other person. And especially, I think it's critical for men to have intimacy with other men. Right. And and we get into, maybe we'll get into this as well. Like homophobia is such a blocker to that in our culture. Internalized homophobia. mm -hmm. We we should, we should touch on that. And just for, I'm going to insert this, the notion of internalized homophobia is simply a homophobia that you are likely not aware that you have, but maybe we could even just back off from that and say erotophobia just an afraid, uh, an afraidness of just even being in connection, intimate, an intimate phobia right? Specifically, yeah, specifically directed at that same sex connection. Yeah. Mm. And, and and I think I I love the notion of erotophobia that you just mentioned. I'm not sure what that means, but I'm, I'm interpreting it on the fly and thinking that like, so coming back to expansive intimacy, I want people to have intimate connection everywhere. And so if I come back to burnout as a a workplace condition, which the World Health Organization has has deemed it's a a workplace phenomenon Mm. uh, due to uh, poorly managed stress. Okay. And I will add, you know, that, (laughs) that yes, you can be a stay at home parent or an entrepreneur and have, um, have burnout as well. But that if I could have intimacy, and I have had this in the workplace with members of any sex, and not worry that by opening myself up, being vulnerable, creating these deep bonds, that I'm somehow inviting a sexual invitation. Now I have this, the psychological safety to be able to share with anybody, like, I'm really I'm really up against it right now. I'm having like a crisis at home and I can't show up the way that I I'm being asked to show up. Can you help? Right. That, so what I'm hearing, you remember when we first learned about erotophobia, we were at um, a sexual attitude. Yeah. yeah, Reassessment, a SAR. And um, it was the two of us went together. It was at the beginning of my formal training to be a sex educator. And it's simply erotophobia is simply fear of sexual and erotic material or ideas or connection. Uh And the reason I think it's relevant here is because when we overlap sex and intimacy, when we euphemize them or or we conflate Mm -hmm. them, we then invite erotophobia, which studies have shown almost all humans raised in this culture have to some degree, some erotophobia. Mm -hmm. So now if you conflate that, now you're going to have some intimate phobia I'm totally uh-huh. just making that up on the fly. Um, and now we ha- are missing what I hear you say is a key piece of managing and even solving burnout. Cause you, I mean, solving it's an ongoing solve, right? It's not, it's not like you solve it and it's done. 
So you yeah, in fact, that there's a critical point in there. And I have deprogrammed myself from talking about solving burnout or that there's a solution to burnout. And I'll credit uh, Dyke Drummond. He's a, an MD who's been doing burnout work for years in the healthcare industry where burnout is so rampant. And he describes a critical labeling error that burnout is not a problem because if it were, we'd have a solution for it. Yeah. Instead, it's a dilemma. And a dilemma requires a set of strategies that we can apply flexibly depending on what our situation is. Yeah, just like wow, jealousy. Yeah. Just like jealousy. Just like jealousy. Jealousy can't be cured. It's yeah. not a problem. It, ha- it has a purpose. It's not a problem. We have to have yeah. strategies any- instead. I love this framing and I'm yeah. seeing how we could apply it so many places. Uh-huh. And I've been talking and talking. So I know you have questions for Jim. So I'll... Sh- I do. I have questions and thoughts and and the questions I had have been kind of driven out of my head by what we've been talking about. Um, But so one of the things that I wanted to say is that you're linking in the title of of tough guy and intimacy, you know, like the, the, the base, the, the assertion that, that intimacy is how you be tough. It's like a, a, a piece of it. It's, um, and whatever tough means, and you could go down a whole bunch of, you know, roads there, but, but whatever it is, it's based on who are you connected to? And I love that so much. Yeah. I so wanted to flip the narrative and especially putting a book out that, that talks about intimacy in this expansive way for men, all of the cultural conditioning that I've had is like, shut that shit down. That's weak. Right. And, and what's, what's tough for a guy is to go there, to, to talk about vulnerability, to talk about intimacy, to share our fears, to share where we need help. Like that's tough. Not the, I'm going to put the stiff upper lip on and, and say that I got it. I'm fine. Right. That's right. not tough. So one of the things that, you know, so we've, we've had a bunch of interactions in, in men's group work and shame comes up so often. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I feel like, what have you found is for a connection with shame and burnout in these places? What, um, what's the role that shame plays for yeah, men? Such a, such a prescient question, Ken, because when I started writing the book, I knew I wanted to write about my burnout experience and how intimacy was the, what got me over it. And that's all I wanted to write about. And I was writing and my developmental editor one day asked me a question on one of the chapters that I had drafted. And he asked me what was the role of stigma in this statistic that I had been playing with. And I went and started looking, oh, okay, is there research on stigma? And I ran into mental health stigma research and things like that, which is highly correlated with burnout. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh shit, shame. Mm-hmm. Now I have to write about shame. And that means I have to look at my own shame. Um, So to your question, um, what I've discovered both in research and looking at my own situation and story, talking to other men about their experiences is this, I'm still working on what, there's a shape. Uh, There's like this, this cyclic or cyclical shape or something, but essentially shame is a factor, huge factor for men in getting into burnout. I need to Mm. live up to societal expectations of what it means to be a man. And so I need to be successful. I need to be strong. I need to not reveal emotions that I might be having to anyone, especially to another man. Um, And, and that's just a really impossible uh, set of conditions I constantly have to succeed without having any weakness, right? So if I have weakness, yeah. Yeah. I now invited shame. It's, so I hear you describing. So we've said that burnout is it's not a problem. It's just a, a thing that requires strategies. And part of what makes those strategies work is the feedback we get about how's things going for me. And I think I just heard you describe that shame interferes with that feedback. Because I might feel, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I should do some self-care. And now shame uh-huh. comes up and says, no, you shouldn't. You should go do That's this right. thing now. Mm-hmm. And Man look up. like a thing out in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. That- Suck it up. And, and, and that's never harder. come up for either of you. That's <laughs> not, no. No. I mean, yeah. For, yeah it's, Sadly, yes. Too often. I, that makes me want to ask both of you, though, what... Even just taking that first, making that first inroad to, I'm going to talk about, 
before there's intimacy, I find there's often talking about intimacy. So it's like a metacognitive level. Mm -hmm. How did you each decide to start talking about intimacy? Because I feel like that's the, maybe we might have listeners who are like putting this in front of the men in their life and saying, listen to this. What was your first way in? What Mm. was your path? Yeah. I don't know that I realize again, like similar to burnout, I didn't know I was in intimacy <laughs> the way that I was until later on. It got named mm-hmm. for me after the fact. It actually got named for me by my partner on our very first date. We got lost in the woods for like four hours on our first date, which was epic and beautiful and a whole other story for another day. And not creepy at all. Fun. <laughs> no, it was so good that it wasn't creepy. Like she didn't, That's awesome. She, she didn't creep me out at all. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you felt safe. <laughs> That's right. I, I totally felt safe with her. Um, but we, we were having this like really wonderful conversation conversation and we're walking, you know, trying to find a trail to get us back. And we were still two hours away from actually hopping in an Uber to get back to the parking lot. But she asked me this question that stopped me in my tracks. Literally, I stopped. I was like, what? And she said, have you ever considered doing intimacy work with men? And I was like, me? Do intimacy work with men? Who do you think you're talking to? Like, I don't know any of that. Uh, and this is a year and a half ago. And I was like, oh, and she reflected some things that I had already shared with her. And we had been conversing for, you know, for some weeks or months before we actually met. And she shared with me this reflection that I had never seen before, that I had actually been doing a lot of work with intimacy in a lot of different forums and formats and, and that I was embodying it. Uh, so it's really only been a year and a half that I realized it. And one of the things I'll give a plug to where I've developed a lot of my trust in being able to be in intimate relationships is my, uh, my work and my practice in improv comedy, which you both are you know, familiar with. And, um, and that space where I've been invited to play in low stakes settings within a lot of different relationships that just emerge over time and, and realize like when I show up authentically and real in those scenes, mm-hmm. I'm practicing some really powerful interpersonal skills that have helped me build a lot of that intimacy in my life. Yeah. And Ken, um, how did you find your way? Cause I hear that and I think, <laughs> right, you might not know you're in it, but once you do, you can then actually start leveraging. Like you can say, oh, this is one of the ways, this is how, but I'm curious what another path Hmm. into intimacy Mm -hmm. has been. So I haven't thought about this question this way until right now. My favorite kind to ask. And (laughs) and I think that throughout my life, I think music has actually been, my Mm. performance of music Mm-hmm. was one of the things that kept the thread of intimacy going from when I was a child. Cause when I was a child, I was all over intimacy. I was, I was a little clingy guy looking for people all the time. Mm-hmm. And then it got socialized out of me. But in the mm-hmm. meantime, I, I played trombone, uh, I played piano, sang. I sang. And in mm-hmm. all of those, except for piano, which I don't do in public or haven't, um, I, I put myself in a position of connecting to people through music. And that, that thread, knowing that it was still possible later on when I kind of surfaced a little bit from the socialization that said, just, just be a rock that doesn't like an inert thing that Mm -hmm. barely even interacts with its environment. Uh, When I started to break out of that, I had that energy, that thread. So it was creativity and sharing the creativity with other people. Um, Storytelling, I would, I would read to the kids and I would make Mm -hmm. up stories for the kids Mm -hmm. And those things kept me connected to it so that when, I mean, when did it start to flourish was in my relationship with you. Well, it's funny that that's, and music was the way in our first date. He said he wanted to sing to me. And I was like, wow. Okay. That's bold. Right. But then it took him like 10 minutes to start. He was just there, like stuck and frozen. And I could see it. Like he was, it was as if it was like watching him melt. Like, okay, I'm going to have to thaw some part of me to sing. And then he sang me that song at our wedding again. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, yeah. Get goosebumps. Right. That jives for me though. It was, so it's sharing some part of you. I don't Mm -hmm. think I recognized it at the time. And I think it could, both of those instances could be interpreted as, as performative, (laughs) but, Mm -hmm. but, you know, improv could be. 
but that doesn't have to be the experience of right. it. Yeah. Music could be performative, but it could also be intimacy and sharing and vulnerability. You know what I think is the, what I heard as you were telling that story and what I, I just underscored as you were saying the performative piece of that, Jolie, is when we are at heart in play, I think it opens up intimacy for us, whether that's playing on an improv oh, stage, playing music, playing with our kids. Yeah. We're pure oh, at that point. Yeah. Right, right. And then it isn't performative. We are literally in it. We're present. Yeah. And so someone might be witnessing but they're not witnessing separate from, and that's what makes it intimacy. Yeah, if mm-hmm. I'm watching you play with the children um, and, and then I'm actually engaging even from my witnessing role, if I'm watching you play on stage, cause I have, I get yeah. to witness and, and be in that. I'm, I'm seeing this shape. Like you described this, there's a cyclical shape here too, between, between people when they are intimate and sharing that way. Yeah. It's so our spirit is free in that moment and you know it's the dance like nobody's watching concepts like playing like nobody's watching you know i think of uh, telling stories to my kids i did puppet shows for my kids when they were little and i was channeling i was i was you know in the flow and it was intimate it was just my being purely there and present and there's nothing more intimate than that like i'm i'm totally discoverable i'm totally connected and I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I'm just being authentically myself. Mm. That's intimacy too. Yeah. Mm. So Jim, you're talking about burnout and you're talking about expansive intimacy. And I think be- because our culture is l- largely having a conversation around burnout and work, burnout in the workplace, specifically um, people in large organizations often get a lot of chatter about burnout. Yeah. Um, and then, so I work with people, I work a lot with couples who often are struggling with burnout that they think is related to their work. But when I get them in a room, often what we notice is, in fact, they're burned out in their relationship. I don't usually call it that, but I would say it's the same symptoms of, yeah, they're highly engaged. Engagement isn't the problem. The problem is that yeah. they're not seeing each other they're not really with each other and they're not really allowing themselves to un- disarm and yeah. be together even when they're together and um so i'm just i'm thinking about the um what expansive intimacy is both between men but also in these intimate moments in our homes and mm-hmm. no matter who you're partnered with no matter who you live with whoever you share that day to day environment what have you found gets in the way of, of, the, of it being this, this medicine for burnout, this application? What stops mm-hmm. it from working? The first thing that comes to mind, and it's not a question I've pondered a lot, but the first thing that comes to mind is when we lose our curiosity, mm-hmm. we, we stop wondering. When I talk about expansive intimacy, one of the dimensions that I look at are all the different types of intimacy that we can have with somebody. So there's sexual, which we've already mentioned. There's physical intimacy. Like, are we touching each other enough in yeah. ways that we enjoy? Do we know which how we want to be touched and how frequently um, are we are we participating in experiential intimacy? There's a, a guy that I coached last fall. And one of the things that I asked him early on was he's, he's, he's married. He has a young child. And I asked him, I said, when's the last time you and your wife went out on a date? And he said, Oh, it's been like a couple of years, you know, just Mm -hmm. so in it with work and with a young child. And I said, all right, I'm going to challenge you go out on a date, you know, schedule a date for the next, you know, next weekend. And he did. And our next call it was like this new person, like he was so energized and he just remembered like, oh, we got to be out and just talk about what's going on in life and ask each other questions. And, and I saw some of that curiosity uh, had returned for him and, and his wife in that experience. And, and so taking that time to really inspect, like, how are we being intimate? And there's other forms of intellectual intimacy where we're, you know, Star Wars versus Star Trek could be intellectual (laughs) intimacy, right? Like geek out, like how do you geek Uh, out together? But I think um, curiosity and, and, and discoverability, like how do we allow ourselves to be discovered? Like what are we interested in is, is a huge part of that. And if anybody wants a a hack for curiosity date, you can go to 
listen to Jolie.com and I have a four page handout they can grab to just go on Beautiful. a date. It, it, the instructions are right there and there are questions. You don't even have to think up questions. You can just ask them. It's great. Mm-hmm. I, it makes me remember this, this concept though, is making me remember about physical intimacy. And I want to come yeah. back to the subject of how do men interact with men? Because mm. Boy, is there a lot of stigma and shame around touching each yeah. other if we're not going to have a sexual interaction. So let us let us go there. I let's do it. Yeah, I mean, please, yeah. Men aren't allowed to touch each other. It's yep. it's so from my perspective out here, it's tragic. And I struggle with my friendships and uh, in lots of ways, but generally speaking, touching of other women. Um, and femmes and non-binary individuals, I have not, I have not experienced the the pushback, but I witnessed from mm-hmm. out here. So Jim, I have a question for you and sure. don't, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but in, in your experience um, in your life of touching other men under whatever circumstances, do you feel any internal pressure as though there's supposed to be a sexual element to what you're doing? Wow, it's a great question. And yes, I right? would say like- The hell like is if, that? <laughs> if, if I touch you that way, it means something. Yeah. It means that I, I want to have some kind of sexual yeah. relation, whether it's intercourse or, or, or something short of that. Yeah. Yep. The only exception I can think of is a handshake. But even then- there are rules. Yeah, there's and, rules about how you do it yep. and how long. Yeah. How long is too long? How long is too long? Do you squeeze? Right. Do right. You, how do you disengage? And it, it because all of it for me feels like there's like mm. in my like this this lesson that comes in from the world, this message that comes in to me from the world that says anything I do should have a sexual component. I'm supposed to be this virile sexual. Um, mm-hmm creature and that everything that i do should be sexual right, the that's part of our dominance yeah which i don't have <laughs> me either I mean, you know me not, I'm, um i am definitely carrying the dominance flag in this room in this little yeah, zoom room we've got yeah. here that is definitely what's going on here and that's that's so interesting because when i when i think about how both of you move in the world i think of leadership I think mm. of leadership. I absolutely do because I've watched you both move in rooms. And I'm like, yep, they're the kind of guy who can stand in the front of a room, holler out, get everybody's attention and make sure the next thing happens. And that's what I think of when I think of leadership. But yeah, what there's, there are all sorts of things that I can do. I am free to do and free to interact because I am not hypersexualized in that way. Mm-hmm. My touch is not mm. like I can reach out and touch other people on the forearm or whatever. And it's in fact, especially because I'm a mother of so many children, it's even mm. more so I'm a mom. There's a, sure. there's a real removal, You're a nurturer. right? There's a removable, m- removable pe- predatory thing. I can just take that right off. So, wow. You guys are carrying around a lot. Yeah. Well, that's a huge thing. What you just mentioned is I've had, I've been in social or business interactions and a woman has touched my arm and that's totally okay would I ever do the same to them Uh uh-uh right because I feel like now I'm going to step over a line that has been crossed by other men that have had you know different intentions right and I just know don't do it you know it's it's not safe and that's that's a shame because you know I so value touch And back to your question, uh, part of your question, Ken, is I'm a hugger and like, I love to hug anybody and that includes men. And I don't do the bro hug, like pat the shoulder, barely Mm -hmm. chest bump. Like I want the full, like I want arms around and and do a real hug. And that doesn't bother me at all. Like that, that's one area where I don't, it's with people that I know and I know that we can hug. Like I cherish that so much like have a real hug with another guy that it's like yeah there's no like this is just us like enjoying the fact that we want to hug each other nothing more and everything about that which is awesome 
Wow, that's and great. You have one place where that is true for you because you play judo. And they get their faces all up in each other's business. Like mm-hmm. yeah. all up. And they faces, are faces, hands, everything. Everything. Just, You're just, just like, very yeah. like I I mean, and yet, and yet nothing, while I find it erotic to watch, that's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the um the experience of it when I watch you in it, I'm like, you're totally in yourself. And that looks just like what he's describing. Like you're just present. Yeah. I don't feel. I know what I'm doing mm-hmm. and why I'm doing Your it. intention is clear. Mm-hmm. To My yourself. intention is clear to myself. Mm-hmm. And, and the container, the container is makes it. There's an agreement. Yeah. An agreement. Yeah. Right. So how do we create more spaces where there is clear agreement that touch is welcome and is not sexualized? until Mm -hmm. we say so we like take that take that that piece out so that touch can be that is a great question and i'd love to hear jim's response and first i just want to say that everything every time i've heard touch enjoy um and some other words too but those two i noticed it it's like those two are are like they're connected like an iceberg to this huge font of expected sexual energy like Mm -hmm. a touch is connected to sex just to say i enjoy something i feel an erotic element to that Uh and it's it's hard it's like it's inaccurate for the world as it exists but there it is inside me coming up every time i hear the words it's completely accurate to the original uses of the words erotic and libido they're they're about life force they're yeah. much more closely related to life force or what like in chinese medicine they you know talk about chi and that they I, that idea but we have in this particular zeitgeist we have co-opted it and made it all about in particular a a, a certain way of ex, of having sexual energy that's pretty yeah, transactional and narrow yeah. and narrow yeah <clears throat> And orgasm based rather than totally. pleasure based, even because, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. So I yeah. lost track of the question. So but first, was... I wanted to complain, apparently, but then, yeah. <laughs> so the question was, I do too. <laughs> how do we create the? How do we create spaces mm. where that agreement that can contain mm. and set the intention allows mm. us to step past what we've been talking about? The this added muck (laughs) that's connected to me the the starting point has to be honestly naming these things and having the maturity to stand there in the conversation be like yeah this is true yeah i have these thoughts and feelings and i know where they come from generally speaking and intellectually i know that it's fine for me to touch another man but this is honestly what happens and can you know how can we now move past that Um, and, and acknowledge that, that we have a need, right. you know, I've got a need and I would like to talk about how that need can be met in this space. How do, how do we be safe about that? And, yeah. you know, what's, what's your need? Do we have, you know, and certainly consent matters in, in, in all the things that we do, but just brutal honesty is, uh, maybe not brutal. You don't have to be brutal. We need to be <laughs> honest. Yeah, radically honest. Get, get consent. For me. Radical. Yeah, like, stop being afraid of these conversations, yes. I think is the point. And you know, for me, I've been afraid of so many conversations for so much of my life that part of writing this book is like saying like, okay, I'm, I'm actually going to finally plant a flag here that says like, this is what I stand for. And, and as soon as I started doing that, you know, towards the beginning of middle of last year, when I started this book project, I got really clear and really honest about who I was, what I felt, what I cared about, what I could say in, in public. And my life got easier. <laughs> Full mm-hmm. stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Me too. I cl- you claim your, your truth, your truth and your intellect and your heart and life yeah. aligns. And there, I, I just came across a thought that I, I want to make sure we get in front of our listeners. Um, when men create space to be intimate with other men, and I think I've heard you say this before, it mm-hmm. unburdens their romantic relationship from being the only source of intimacy. A thousand percent. And I'll give you a, a live example. Yes. I was on a call yesterday with this group of men who I co-created this group a year and a half ago, and we meet once a month. And I've only met one of these persons one time. 
Um, everybody else is scattered. There's six of us on the call and we get together for 90 minutes once a month and we just talk about real stuff. And yesterday I was talking about some really difficult challenges that I've been going through with my mother and my sister around my mother's living situation. And I had the space where I could name so much of what was going on. And I didn't even realize going into this conversation, like what was going on. Somebody mentioned Mother's Day and like, it just dropped in for me. I was like, oh shit, I'm dealing with so much grief and so much anger and all these things that I don't want to deal with that would be normally sitting under the surface. And I got to bring them out into the open with this, these other five guys. And they held that space for me so beautifully and shared and asked me questions and cared for me in ways that I totally needed. And I get to my partner's house last night. She's recovering from COVID as, you know, normally somebody I, I absolutely would talk to about this, but she didn't probably need that. And I could tell her, hey, I had this amazing call where I got to process all this stuff. Mm. I don't need your energy for this right now. And we could instead wow. focus on the care she needed. Yeah. I would give you a standing ovation if, <laughs> um, if I weren't in this cramped space. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would give those men a standing ovation every time I meet with them because it's just the, one of the biggest blessings I have in my life is to have that group of men where we can go everywhere. Okay. So I am here for action steps. And what <laughs> I heard is here is an actionable idea that anyone, any person, but let's, let's really be clear here. And Chris, if you identify as a man, <laughs> this is a thing that could be in your life because Jim, you instigated this group, right? This was yeah. just an idea. Yeah. So 18 months ago or 19 months ago, this was an idea and it went from idea to reality because you did what, how, how did you take this action step? What did it look like? Mm -hmm. We co-created so I didn't need to lead or be the guy who figured it out, mm -hmm. which is a role that I'm really good at. And I, instead, I knew one of these people, one and a half of these people. And we just said, hey, we're interested in the same kinds of conversations and let's invite other like-minded guys into this conversation and we'll just see what happens. And over time, we've had structured agendas where we've used um, a, a process called the case clinic by a guy named Otto Sharmer uh, to process things and really give somebody focus. And then we've just become organic, but we just connected people that we knew. And it was, you know, it, originally eight people, now we're six. And we just get together and we talk and, and we have, we don't even have like you know, I've been involved in a lot of groups and like setting agreements and, you know, defining, we did a little bit of that up front, but it's so clear that we're just there to show up and be real yeah. and not pull any punches mm. and support each other, yeah. celebrate each other, whatever's needed. So you could have minimal, um, agreement setting. I'm thinking like you co we're co-creating this could be one. Yep. Um, assume goodwill when someone's speaking, just, just assume they're coming from the best place they can in that moment. Yep. Um, take care of your, your needs and boundaries. Yep. Yeah. Like, we don't offer advice. That's right. That's, yeah. It's been really important. No offering advice, um, you know, and obviously confidentiality, you know, it, and those it's are, really like, that's a great framework to be able to get into a space with people who want to explore the things that you're interested in, or in a lot of cases, like, People are exploring stuff that I haven't thought about, which is great because now I get to learn from yeah. people who have big hearts and souls and minds. And, and some of it we're only going to learn once we're going through it. You know, you, you watch somebody go through the loss of a parent and you learn, you pregame, oh, oh, it could be like that. It, and, and here's how we can show up for each other with yeah. full intimacy. I'm My mind's blown. Hmm. I've been to a few different men's group, including the one that I did with you, Jim. And what, when you first described this, when you first told the story of going there and just, that just, you know, you just say what's going on. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've gone because I thought I was supposed to, because it seemed yeah. like a good idea to try to connect to people and try to get, you know, work through my stuff. And I made, you know, progress and stuff. But that is the first time I felt my body light up. Like that sounds mm -hmm. great. And it I think is. it was the clear simplicity of what you just described of people standing or, you know, connected and 
giving each other space to say all the things. And then yeah, I heard we you enjoy just... each other. Mm. Wow. Bring that word back. Oh, great. Now that's... he's going to tear up. Oh, what's that like? <laughs> um, and then, and then I heard you describe one of the, that, that you turned something that with your partner could have been burdensome instead of sharing a burden, you, you could share a celebration that yeah. you, that you had this experience that was so valuable to you. And instead of coming to them with, oof, help me hold this up. You yes. were like, this was awesome. Share this with the, yeah, that sounds great. It was really, and, and I know how much she appreciated it. I, I texted her in the middle of the afternoon. I said, Hey, I had my, you know, my, my men's group call and she, she knew exactly what that meant. And she was just so excited for me. And um, there's an article I read probably three or four years ago. I think it was in Harper's Bazaar and it talked about emotional gold digging. Oh. And how, you know, we talk about gold diggers and, and label that as, you know, for, for female identifying people like who are just out, there, out, out for the money from, from a, a, a man. Well, the flip side in, you know, heteronormative kind of traditional terms is men who only go to their their wife their their partner their yeah. spouse for their emotional support needs and how unsustainable that is yep. for the relationship for the the woman for the man for for everybody involved and how limiting it's yeah. so limiting uh, one it, point it creates, of view and, it creates a yeah. closed circuit and there's yeah. no fuel for the fire. It's, I mean, and if you look towards Esther Perel's work and think about the novelty versus stability paradox, right? We think about novelty. It's not just about who do you want to fuck. It's about who do you yeah. want to share yourself with so that you can yeah. bring some of that oxygen back. Yeah. There's and so to much- have all these, and this is really what expansive intimacy is about for me is that I have all of these outlets, whether that's my men's group, whether that's my partner, whether that's my ex-wife, frankly, I have an intimate relationship still with her that's entirely appropriate for the phase of what our relationship is today. My improv teammates who are wonderful friends, other, you know, I I just have all of these places with all these, to your point, Ken, like different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Um, I have, I have all these different sources of oxygen <laughs> when I need to breathe through something and somebody can tell me something different, you know, and Hey, you know, there, there are going to be times where I'm having a challenge with my partner. And if I only have one place to go to and talk to my partner, well, what do I do when I have an issue with my partner? Cool. Now I've got my friends to talk to uh, yeah. I have these other men, especially because for years, really for up until about 10 years ago, I had zero intimate connections with men in my life. I was so afraid of opening myself up to another man. It had never been modeled for me. I didn't know how to do it. Um, And having access to that has been an absolute game changer for me. Right. So I have to say that I I can't even imagine how the game might have changed for you because I'm just starting to imagine what it is to have the experience of being in the group like, like you just described. I, I hear people talk about men's work and the connection among men. And um, I, I generally, I can't imagine it. I don't know what it, what, what that means. Um, yeah. So there's something have, for me to. Yeah. I've explore. watched you. It's, it's um. so I'm guessing that people listening might have a similar experience. So what I see the image that comes to mind is you have repeatedly reached out and sort of come up and it's as if you're trying to go up a steep hill and, and you come up and, and you get just so far and then, and then it rolls back down yeah. into the, not just the habitual, though it is that, but also like, oh, that didn't really catch. It didn't work. And then you roll back down and now you're, you're also a little demoralized yeah. from mm-hmm. that didn't work. What if I can't? And so now at 55, you've had a bunch of those runs. And you haven't yet gotten to a spot where you really feel like you are fully seen and accepted. Yeah. And I think it's courageous to just name that because here we talk about intimacy all, all the time, the time mm-hmm. but it is, it is absolutely true in our household that I provide a lot of the external, I pull that in and you have struggled with it over and over again. Yeah. So regardless of how much we, we try there, mm-hmm. like, it can be really, really hard. It can be really challenging. So mm-hmm. I'm hearing though, that you at some point took ownership of this. And 
I'm guessing, but correct me if I'm wrong, it wasn't to solve the burnout. I'm hearing that you later realized that you had not solved. I want, let's move away from that word. It's not that it had addressed it. It, You hadn't strategized and said, I'm going to go make intimate relationships to, to get this burnout under control. Right. Instead, you were doing the intimacy and then realized that it was helping the, the burnout and you are a busy man, Ken. You have, I, I keep, yeah. I keep his life. He's juggling chainsaws all uh-huh. the time. Seven uh-huh. kids, a business of mine that he's I now operating up for in, every part of this. this. That's a lot. And so yeah. what would your advice be to someone who has taken a run in intimacy with men, but has not found their home yet? Mm. What would you tell them? For some reason, the life purpose statement, the four word life purpose statement that dropped into my head when I was doing some coaching work uh, with my coach years ago comes to mind and it's slow down and connect Mm. those words. When I first heard those, it was like, well, you know, I couldn't understand, like, why would that be the purpose of my life? And I just trusted them. And over time, I've, I I keep having those words come back to me like they just did. And to recognize that, you know, maybe the metaphor of the juggling chainsaws came up, uh, brought that up because I've lived that life as well. Like I, I will stay so busy and there's a badge of honor in that. I think for all of us, for men, maybe a slightly different way. Productivity Um, culture. Yeah. Be the provider, be the protector, be the, you know, be be the one who's achieving all the time. Uh, That's, that's a huge part of my story. And the, I'm going to use air quotes here, indulgence to connect Mm -hmm. with other things that are going to slow myself down, to see how I feel, to, to connect with another person in a really meaningful way. It's counterintuitive. It's countercultural, even I think for, for my experience. And, you know, that to me, like that simple phrase has been a lifeline for me at, at times. And to realize that like, if I just get off the hamster wheel for a second and look at like, what am I doing? And what do I actually want to be experiencing instead? And invariably it comes down to, I want to be connected. I want to be connected to source or spirit. And that's internal work. A lot of times, Mm -hmm. sometimes it's nature, but oftentimes it's people. I want to, I want to be with people in a way that's meaningful. I want to know what's going on with my kids and their struggles and their joys. I want to, you know, have deep friendships, you know, and, and I don't know if that answers the question, but that was the inspiration that struck. Yeah. Me. Okay. Good. Well, I like it because it also is a reminder that um, one of the places where each of us has more intimacy in our life is our, our children. They are burgeoning mm-hmm. adults, yeah. right? And yours, I know you're at this phase too, where yeah. as our children transition out of their child state into their adult state, there's a lot of being close and intimate and, and being all up in their lives and letting go the practices yeah. of both. Um, and I wonder if that's part of what it can feel like there's a lot of intimacy and there is, but it's not necessarily diverse. It's not necessarily outside of the household. And so it's not expansive. It's not expansive. Uh-huh. Right. right. So there's the yeah. challenge. But that's it. Like, like start somewhere. Like we all know intimacy in some way. So like, what's great about intimacy and how do you show up in the space that you are able to already create intimacy? And then what can you do? Because then now there's a risk. That's the other, excuse me, thought that was in my mind when you asked that last question is, it's been about taking risk for me and putting myself into new situations where I'm going to be uncomfortable, where I have to reveal something that people don't know about me yet that I'm probably protecting or hiding and this is where shame comes back in. Uh, you asked the question earlier, like how does shame relate to burnout? It gets us into burnout. It keeps us in burnout because I can't, I can't say that I'm burned out. I'd be weak. And so I just stay in it. I'll keep doing it. But it's also the front door to intimacy. When I can reveal my shame, when I can talk about the things that feel hard or broken or scary or whatever it is that, that feels shameful to me, I have taken a big risk. And whenever I've done that, I've created intimacy because somebody has been able to see me for who I really am. And there's a part of them that connects with it. They see it like it's a different story, but the details aren't important. 
they're like, oh yeah, me too. I've been there. Oh, I, I worry about that too. And now we have a bond that's never going to be broken because we know each other. Right. Knowing. Knowing. I, I say all the time that being to be um, seen is to be loved. And that's, that's what I'm hearing. That, that, yeah. And this expansiveness, I can start anywhere. So you have started, you started with nature. That was your place of expanding. Yep. And yet, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I feel the clarity. Ken is so often on this podcast. I know you've listened to some episodes, Jim. He is so often learning on the fly, but also being vulnerable and sharing like, oh, yep, we're still working on that. And I'm really grateful that you would be present to, to how hard this is for you right now here. In the yeah, I, I, the, the vulnerability of saying, so this is how things go for me, that that's a problem problem. That's, that's an experience that I have integrated into my life in a way that's like, okay, yep, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to take this risk. What blocks me, what, like that, what you described about rolling up the hill and then rolling back is follow through. I don't know what, like, it's oh. probably all connected, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll share and then I'll, I'll have a relationship and then I'll just sort of drop it. And I won't put the energy in to maintain the connection. I'll, I'll create a connection, but I won't maintain it. That's the thing that's um, just, that's what trips me up. That's where I fall down. Yeah. And one of the other things that makes me think of Ken is that this notion of expansive intimacy could seem overwhelming. Like, oh my God, I now have to have 20 people that I maintain intimate connections with. And that's not suitable for certain people. And expansive intimacy could be three people in your life. Right. And it could be some black and white thinking on my part too of, okay, if I'm going to have this relationship, it's going to be as significant and as um, energetically, it's going to require as much energy as the relationship I have with Jolie. Oh, nothing will take that much. I am so much work and I'm proud of it. I love being high maintenance. And I love it. I love the relationship. And um, if, if that's what someone else is looking for in a connection, I don't have two of those. Um, and then, and so I don't, yeah, and yeah. there's, there's more to dig and, into there. But. Well, there is, it, that's an interesting one. Cause I do like, I, I yep. have had multiple, this course, level relationships. Well, that's the other thing is I tell myself, I don't do I, I but don't know. I didn't know. think I had this for you. <laughs> right. So uh-huh. here it is. So it, it's, well, and each, each relationship gets to be different and, right. and it will, and will be absolutely different. Yeah. 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 Um, I so I have this. some imagination problems, I think, around what. Don't we all? What into yeah. imagination problem? Like, imagine something new and then just make it happen. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck it up. Have a good time. <laughs> That's it. Fuck it up in the in, That's the, in good the great advice. in the spirit of the great fuck it. Right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Pam Victor's um, rallying yeah. call for yeah, us. You know all. where I learned that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Exactly. You know. I am so grateful that we had this conversation both on a professional level, but also on a personal level. This is an issue that comes up in our house over and over again. And burnout hasn't manifested in a traditional way in a long time in our house because we have such um, creative lives. But I think now I'm actually seeing the flip, like where there's a lack of intimacy, I can actually like use that as one of the canaries in the mind for Mm -hmm. oh is there actually hidden burnout is there this sense of of lack or or just a crispness of a friedness Mm -hmm. um because i might not be able to identify it otherwise i you know when we're not not working in a traditionally um corporate environment maybe i don't recognize it but now oh if there's a lack of intimacy i should probably do a little check i should probably do an assessment Am I in burnout and I'm not seeing it? Yeah, I love that. I, I have, I, this is new for me to think of that as a reverse diagnostic. Yeah. Uh, to say like, oh, can I, can I look at where is my intimacy waning? And is that putting me at risk to get into some state of burnout? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's great. I mean, it's, it's the, I'm thinking about the, um, you said that it, expansive intimacy is burnout's opposite and two mm-hmm. things don't have to be mutually exclusive to be opposites. Yeah. So you, it's not that you necessarily, but it seems like a good, a good check-in, like, yeah. especially if someone is just in denial, because I can imagine 
denying the idea that you need intimacy, but I can also imagine denying burnout, right? Like, and getting stuck in the idea that no, that's a thing that happens to other guys. That yeah, doesn't happen that, to me. Uh, that's that shame thing that sits yeah. right in the middle yeah. of both of those two. Yeah. yeah. Is, you know, if I'm in my shame, I'm not going to acknowledge either one of those. I'm not going to acknowledge the need for intimacy or the presence of burnout. Yeah. And so that's why shame, when it popped up in the research and, and the work that I was doing, I was like, oh, I have to, have to, have to write about this because it is, I think the, it what creates the double bind. Right. And that's always a problem. I think this has been incredibly powerful. And Jim, you have a book coming out very yeah. soon. Tell everybody about the book. And then after that, we'll talk about where people can find you, but tell them what they can expect from the book. Yeah, the book's called Expansive Intimacy, How Tough Guys Defeat Burnout. It'll be out in late September this year. Uh, it's my first book. Uh, it's been a joy to write. I've really loved the process. It's There's a lot of storytelling in there, my stories as well as other stories. Um, perhaps even one of you show up in the book. <laughs> Quick teaser there. Um, thank you for your, your participation in that. Um, and a lot of research as well, uh, because there's a lot of good science around uh, these topics, whether it's shame, whether it's intimacy, whether it's burnout. Um, and I hope it's really relatable and enjoyable. Some of the initial feedback I've gotten is that it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty good stuff to read. I hope so. Um, well, and, I've read um, some clips. I've read some, some clips out of it. And I think that you not only have put the research into it, which I really appreciate um, so much, because you're not just taking a, here's how I solve burnout. You went to the books, yeah. you went to the bigger picture. Yes. And that is, to my mind, just a wonderful way to approach a topic, but, um, but also it's just an enjoyable read. Every clip that I've read, I'm like, mm. Oh yeah, this is engaging. So I yeah, want everybody my, to get one it. One of my goals <laughs> is to, is to hit this really big set of topics and also bring in the element of me that, that stems off one of my life values, which is create as much fun as possible. How can we actually have fun talking about this? Mm -hmm. And not that everything is going to be light and humorous, but there's going to be pieces in there that I hope get people like, oh yeah, like I can laugh at myself or wow, that's a big situation. And I can look at that differently. Well, uh, you I want to normalize this stuff. You definitely made Ken laugh at himself oh, yeah. in the description yep. you wrote of him. I, I'm so glad I videotaped Good it. Stuff. I appreciated that video <laughs> clip so much. <laughs> so, Jim, you are also a, you're a burnout coach for men specifically, but I'm mm -hmm. guessing that as you, as you deepen this practice of expansive intimacy, people are going to figure out that they need you. So how do they find you? Yeah, they can find me most easily at thecenteredcoach.com. That's my home online. It's really the only place you need to, to go. I don't want to give you a big list. Perfect. That's perfect. So go to the centeredcoach.com. I'll put that in the show notes yep. and you can always reach out to me as well. And I will connect you with Jim. If you are mm. a regular listener, I have this wonderful connection to my listeners. And if one of you is thinking, this is the episode to put in front of my husband, just do it. Just do it. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200 until you have gotten this in front of them, because I am so grateful for this conversation. Thank you for having it with us. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here with me today and just letting me be on the show. I, I just adore both of you. It's so fun to get a chance to talk to you both at the same time and, and explore this, all these topics. Thanks, Jim. It's so much fun talking with you as always. Yeah. Good to see you too, Ken. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I have one more thing to share with you. If you want to pop over to listen to Jolie.com, that's just listen to Jolie, J O L I.com, you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Yeah, get the guides. They're easy to implement conversations that will empower you to create the love you want. It's my mission to make everything talk aboutable sex, love, losses, and learns. Everything is talk aboutable. <laughs> she managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my lovers, my friends, my family, and you all on a podcast out loud. Relationship work really can change everything. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way you'd hoped, remember relationships can be messy, and that's good news. 